what's the role of resilience, resilience thinking in your approach? Mm -hmm. So resilience is a, is a concept that is increasingly um, getting attention in the scientific literature, but also um, amongst, for example, EU development agencies and so on. So it's actually entering in a big way into the development literature and development policy discourses as well. What is resilience in the first place? So resilience in the first place is, um, the technical definition is something like this, the ability of a system to absorb shocks and continue functioning and developing. So that basically is resilience. So meaning if you're a social ecological system, if you're a landscape with people and the environment, what does it mean to be resilient? Well, it means that, for example, if there's a, an economic crash in some stock, it doesn't hit you so much. You, you're okay. You basically continue to function. Or if there's a particularly dry summer and, say, your, one of your crops fails, well, maybe some other crops won't fail, but they did okay anyway. And then you'd be resilient. And you'd be not very resilient, for example. One of the things we see a lot of the time is um, that highly optimized systems that are optimized to produce just one function, they're often not very resilient. So, for example, um, take an example from Australia. If you're a wheat farmer, just as an example, in Australia, and you have a dry year, then your entire wheat crop might fail. Your whole source of income is gone, just like that. That wouldn't happen to the smallholders here, who have lots of different kinds of crops, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So their strategy is less efficient in the sense of optimizing one particular kind of yield, but it's probably more resilient. So resilience is this concept of maintaining function despite shocks. Resilience thinking, then, is a slightly broader idea. And resilience thinking is all about um, recognizing the social ecological systems context, how different things affect one another, recognizing feedbacks in those systems. So what kind of feedbacks do people get from nature, for example? Do they even notice that their activities are maybe changing the environment? If you think about places like Western Europe, often we don't notice anymore how we're actually destroying the environment somewhere very far away because we're not seeing it anymore. So those kinds of things are also part of resilience thinking, thinking about feedbacks like that, thinking about sudden changes that might happen when systems reach tipping points. So resilience thinking is a slightly, slightly broader concept. Um, both resilience and resilience thinking have influenced a lot of our work um, in the background, if you like. So a lot of the time we don't use the terminology of resilience in, say, our scientific papers. But I think the logic and the rationale behind that way of approaching social ecological systems runs throughout our research. I've read um, on, on, an, on an internet um, website that uh, resilience might change, might replace the term of sustainable mm -hmm. development. What do you think about this? Mm. That's an interesting point, and I think, um, I think there's a bit of debate about this. So sustainability is what we call a normative concept, meaning it has a certain, it has a certain judgment, value judgment to it, right? It basically, sustainability is all about justice between generations, so between now and the future, and also justice within the um, people currently living on the planet, and maybe also justice for the environment. So that's the idea of sustainability, um, that we don't sort of take away from future generations the ability to enjoy nature, for example, in the same way that we do. So it actually is about values. Resilience, if you look at it um, with a technical definition that I just gave you, um, is actually just the ability of a system to continue functioning. There's no value as to um, whether that's good or bad. The mafia is very resilient. Mm -hmm. It'll continue functioning despite being chased by police and whatever. So not everything that's resilient is very good. For example, I mean, just to take another example, our capitalist um, farming systems are very resilient. They're not going away despite some people thinking they ought to go away. So resilience is not necessarily a good thing. And sometimes, so some, some things that are resilient, you want to be resilient and you're happy about those being resilient. And some other things are perhaps things that you'd really like to get rid of, but because they're so resilient, it's very hard to achieve that. So I think that resilience thinking, so thinking about the notions of resilience and the related concepts, can be extremely useful to achieve, um, if you like, sustainable development. But I wouldn't say that resilience can directly replace this idea of sustainability, because one's a sort of 
value-laden concept, sustainability, whereas resilience is more of a technical concept in a strict sense. And so the loose use of the term resilience is a bit problematic. Not all resilience is good. Okay, one of the last questions. What I've become more uh, conscious about today was that um, it looks like um, young people, they tend to... Um, uh, um, today, during your presentation in Agarbichu, I've seen that young people were uh, voting for um, for scenario number three. Prosperity through growth. Uh, no. Yeah, and balance brings beauty. Mm -hmm. Balance brings beauty. Mm -hmm. So they actually want to keep what we have as right. natural beauties, which I personally um, enjoy as well and uh, would prefer. And um, I've understood as well that authorities they prefer a completely different scenario. The mm -hmm this growth, mm -hmm. one of the growth scenarios. Right. And, um, well, maybe that's one of the problems that we have in, in here in this re re area of study, mm -hmm. that the different actors, different power groups, stakeholders, they have a very different um, perspective scenarios mm -hmm. in their head. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, how do you comment on this? How can you develop the area in a certain way when there are different scenarios in the minds of, of different groups that have a certain power. That's right. So I think one of, the, one of these axes in our scenario planning exercise is what the national and supranational policy settings are doing. And those settings at the moment strongly favor economic growth at the expense of the natural environment. So unless that changes, basically there are two scenarios of the four that we created which you can't reach. And one of those is this balance brings beauty. So that said, you're still better off with proactive communities coming together and trying to work towards the common good, no matter what these external settings are. So in a sense, the rationale of what does it mean for me as a local community member, actually it's independent of whatever these external settings are. It's probably worthwhile for civil society to get together and increasingly become kind of more organized, more working collaboratively, and so on and so forth. So that is probably worthwhile no matter what the policy settings are. I think because we're, we're taking our scenarios with a 30-year horizon, okay? So we're talking about the year um, 2043, I think, in our scenarios. They were developed at the end of 2013. And if you think 30 years into the future, a lot of things can happen. 30 years ago, this country was a very different place, right? 30 years ago was 1984. There was communism, there was a Berlin Wall, there were no iPhones, and the world was a very different place. Okay, so basically in 30 years the world might again be a very different place. It's quite possible that the common agricultural policy, for example, will go through another reform in 12, 15 years, which might completely turn around um, the settings from an economic perspective. So I think from my perspective as someone interested in sustainable development that benefits people and the environment, I think we can just continue to hope and work towards policy settings that are more favorable of genuine sustainability. Um, but of course, I agree with you that at the moment we don't have those settings and at the moment it would be very difficult to, um, it, it is very difficult to work towards what we sort of consider a balance brings beauty scenario. Um, given the policy settings. That doesn't mean that we can't try, and I'm sure that the outcome, if you try, will be better than if you just give up on the whole thing, in which case you might find yourself in the our land, their wealth scenario, with basically nobody benefiting very much apart from um, foreign investors. Okay, is there anything that you would like to add, or do you have a message to the world? Then please. I have one message that needs to be, I have two messages that need to be on camera. So the first one is, I'm Johann Fischer, I'm from Neufana University Lüneburg in Germany. And the project that I want to say a bit about is um, on basically sustainable development trajectories in central Romania. That's no good, let's start that again. Das hast du jetzt so vorgestellt, als ob du das dann an den Anfang setzen willst. Müsste man dann. Wobei das im Schnitt schlecht gehen wird, weil ich... Gut. Okay, ich frage da mal anders. Frag mal anders, ich muss noch irgendwie den Fan dann nennen und wo ich herkomme. Ist es okay, wenn es am Schluss kommt? Oder willst du es unbedingt am Anfang? Nö, wo es herkommt, ist völlig wurscht. Ja. Wenn es am, ich tue es dann am Ende rein. Ja, okay. okay. 
Okay, uh, yeah, please tell us something about the very practical aspects, the funding, the, the amount, the funders, the participants, where the researchers come from. Yeah, That's yeah. very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. You're high, really high profile people. I sure. Say. So I think um, first, the nicest thing is that I work with the best team in the universe, um, which is comprised of um, four PhD students working on this project. Um, and then there are a couple of postdocs who are also working on this project. And, and we have close Romanian collaborators as well. And it's this entire team that's made this project possible. And yeah, I think it's been great fun working with that team. So I'm very happy about that. We're based at Leuphana University Lüneburg, which is also a very interesting university, I'd say. Um, it has taken a radical reform trajectory a few years ago, um, orienting itself around the concept of sustainability. Unlike all other universities in Germany and most others in the world, we have the Faculty of Sustainability, one of four faculties in the university. So this is um, a great place to be conducting this kind of integrated research. And finally, I guess the most important thing is that we couldn't do this without money. And we've been very fortunate to get generous support by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in Germany. Okay, who are uh, partners of the project or other funders? Mm -hmm. Um, so our main project partners in Romania are the Mihai Eminescu Trust, as well as um, Dr. Tibor Hartl from Sapientia University. And then we've worked with all kinds of other organizations and individuals as well. So, for example, we've worked with Fundatia Adept as well. We've worked with um, the Milvers Group. Uh, we've worked with um, the WWF as well. Um, We've worked with a whole lot of community groups, like around churches, around certain sort of local action groups. And so there's a whole range of different people that we've involved at different levels. And also we've had a lot of sort of uh, seasonal help from, from various people from Romania and also from, from many other countries, in fact, from the UK, from France, from um, the Netherlands. So we've had a lot of different people involved in this project and all of them have made really important contributions. So, if you have a message to the world, please. One that is connected to the things we've been talking about, <laughs> preferably. What can people in other parts of the world learn from what you have found out here in Transylvania? No, I need to think about that more. Like, do we do we need a big question like that? Would you? Are you keen on a big? Otherwise, I feel. I mean, I feel happy with what we've got. Mm -hmm. I, like, I have all kinds of general rants to the world about stuff, but I feel like mm -hmm. they're not going to connect. Very okay, well. then uh, my very last question: uh, Will there be a follow-up of this project, or mm -hmm. what will be your next project? Yeah. So, um, I guess the two different two different questions: Will there be a next project? Um, I'm in the process of starting a new project, again, looking at social ecological systems and how they change, which will actually have a global focus. It will be on how to integrate food security and biodiversity in developing countries. The focus will be global, but there will be a case study in Ethiopia, where food security and biodiversity decline are ongoing issues. Um, and in terms of ongoing work in Romania, well, I hope that work here will continue in some ways, but perhaps less direct ways of me being here with the research team than so far. So I'm sure that my dear friend and colleague Tibor Hartl from Sapientia University is going to continue to work on social ecological systems in this area. And we've also got um, some funding applications in at the moment in Germany to perhaps continue some work here. Um, but it's still up in the air whether work will be funded or not. We'd of course be thrilled if we can continue to work here because it's a very nice place. Okay, thanks a lot and keep up your good work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.